Uh, Stephen Kisby Green is with us this morning to give us his team of the tournament in the Six Nations so far. He's he's an innocent man, a, a bystander in all this. Although we hope we've managed to make him a little bit biased towards Ireland, or maybe maybe we've poisoned him against Ireland by making him listen to this show every day. Stephen, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, Jim. Morning, man. How's things? Where the hell are you? Uh, I'm in the lovely Drakensberg in the middle of in the middle of South Africa, enjoying my 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 holiday from uh, from you guys. <laughs> Uh, where is where is Drakensberg? So it's sort of bordering Kuzuna Natal and Lesotho. Um, so it's just it's basically the biggest mountain range in southern Africa. Wow, um, it looks amazing. I've got Google Images here. Oh my god. Oh sorry, it's up the screen. <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah. No, unfortunately, um, I've brought Dublin weather with me, so you guys can't see it this morning. But um, I took some photos last night that I think Tom, Tommy's putting on the on, on the screen now. So uh, that's roughly what I've been looking at. Uh, this week and um, what's the wildlife like uh depending on where you go it's, it can be like, there's no lions or mountain lions that are going to take you out on, on your hikes that's what you're asking it's um, a lot of baboons which can be a little bit frightening if you come across one um, mid-hike but um uh, some nice uh, birds of prey some buck if you're lucky enough to spot them in the in the in the felt it's Whatever you'd imagine um, South African wildlife to be, you can find it roughly here. No big predators in the berg, but um, you, you, I wouldn't advise going uh, hiking alone if you don't know what, what you're doing. Okay, of. okay. And sorry, I, this is not what we were supposed to talk about, but how big is the baboon <laughs> when you come across them? Uh, like, wh why are they scary? Because they seem to have quite big teeth. They have huge teeth and they do not back down. It's it, they they can actually rip your throat out if you, if if you're not too too careful. But the, all you need to do is make yourself seem big and don't sort of back down, and you, they'll usually run away. That's but easy for you. <laughs> I say I say don't take this as survival guide like verbatim <laughs> because I'm I, I'm I'm I am a city a city boy at heart. <laughs> that's a that, that's a pretty good guide for life right there, Stephen. I think make yourself big. <laughs> yeah. Make uh, yourself big. Not something the Irish can do too too often. No. Oh yeah. Shots fired. Uh, <laughs> so you've you've been um, keeping an eye on on the Six Nations so far, and, and you've decided to pick your team of the Six. We've tasked you with picking your team of the Six Nations so far. Was this relatively straightforward and easy? What were your criteria? Well, the, uh, so the criteria was trying to get a a player from each team in the starting fifteen. It's more difficult than it sounds, particularly when you got the likes of Italy in your in, in, in the in the tournament. So, I've unfortunately failed at putting an Italian in, in, the, in the starting 15. But uh, I think you can forgive me for that one. Um, the players themselves need to have played at least 70 minutes. Obviously, if there's something particular, if there's somebody particularly exceptional after 50, I could make an exception. But thankfully, nobody really stood out more that played less than 70 minutes. Um, I also didn't feel the need to. Like to hone in on somebody's uh, position that they've played in the first two rounds. Uh, if they if they're capable of playing another position and I wanted to move them there, I did feel a little bit like it was my prerogative to do so. I mean, it is my team after all. And then I wasn't going to rate too highly anybody's anybody's performance against Italy because this is arguably one of the worst Italian sides we've ever seen in in the professional era so a very strong performance against Italy would be likening to an average performance against the rest of them okay that's fair enough it, it, and it is early and we'll obviously be able to revisit this after rounds four maybe and at the end so um was there anybody specifically you had in mind when you uh, invented the criteria of I'm going to move players to a position if there are too many good players in that position who are you thinking of I was actually thinking of where I was going to put Tyke Byrne because he, in my opinion, is not a, he's not a lock. I, I think he's firmly suited to to a to a flank. Um, he's built in the mold of a Peter Steff toy in my book, and I think I wanted to move him to seven. But yeah, I'm I'm doing it the South African way, not the not the Irish way. Um, I wanted to move him to seven, but then obviously Josh van der Fleer has also been playing phenomenal rugby, so I didn't actually end up moving him. But then I also. Uh, was looking at the at the wingers. Um, some some wingers couldn't I, I, you couldn't ignore, which I'll get, which we'll obviously I'll get to. Can we can we, uh, hang, so, can we just hang on on Tyke Byrne for a minute? So yeah, uh, in this part of the world, I have never heard anybody ever talk about him as a seven. There's been talk of him plenty of he's played plenty of, of six, and that was they get him into the team as a six, and then oh he's not big enough for a uh, second row, but actually he's playing well enough now to be in the second row. Um, 
in South Africa, would you consider him in a seven role? Is that what you're telling us? That you so would look at him so and that, go, uh, yeah, he's a seven. What? I, th- I think it's more to do with we we sw- we swap open side and blind side flankers around pretty much. Okay. Um, so, so so an Irish six is a South African seven, and a South African seven is oh, South African six is an Irish seven, basically. What? Why? What's what's what, what's why? What's the reason for that? Uh, the sink, the water goes down the sink different directions. That's what I was thinking, yeah. Probably dyslexia or something, I don't know. But uh, it, 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 for me, it seems odd to see him Ambi- wearing a six jersey. It's ambidextrous. Yes. That's it. It's, yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, it's like, you look at him and you think, I can't see him wearing the same jersey as a Sia Khaleesi, but I can see him wearing the same jersey as a Peter Steff de Toy. Okay, okay. So, so, yeah, okay. So if, if they came up to the Northern Hemisphere, they were playing the opposite side, obviously, as well. Yeah, yeah. So, it, a, if, 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 whoever's deciding um, exactly what number they're on the back, you can change the, the two flanks around if you want. But uh, this is the way um, I'm but, setting it up. But the roles aren't. The, the, the responsibilities in the roles. Because, it, 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 you know, is an open side flanker the, the job different in South African traditionally? I wouldn't strictly say so. It depends on the actual player themselves um, and the balance of the team. So, for example, at the moment, South Africa's hookers do most of the 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 the, the, the jackling over the ball so uh, so Khaleesi and Smith who played most of um, the November series wouldn't worry too much about going over the breakdown as much as securing the breakdown and um, securing the ball like South African ball and actually being being physical members of the of the of the breakdown as opposed to jackling so it, so that South Africans don't really fit too much into the this uh, bl- blind side needs to be on the ball all the time and needs to hassle the okay. the, the fly off etc cetera, etc. Cetera. It's more um, based on the on the balance of the team. Okay. Oh, that that all makes sense. Let Let's get into the team itself. So the best forwards, you've gone with Andrew Porter, Jamie George, Ty Furlong, Adam Beard, Ty Byrne at five, Hamish Watson at six, Van der Fleer at seven. And Gregory Aldred at eight. So not a lot of Frenchies. No. Which is, and you know, they they they. In fairness, they played Italy. It's hard to be impressive, but they did batter us. So th- this is where a lot of the controversy is going to come in. I went heavily against the the French in in the in the fourth purely because they're too. Physical and one-dimensional, which from a South African sounds hilarious, probably sounds hilarious. Um, Andrew Porter and and Tyke Furlong, we know exactly how brilliant they are. Granted, they weren't, uh, they were a, a little bit pushed back in the scrums and against against the French, but it's they, they've proven what modern day props can and should be about and that's not just being about the set piece but also what you can do off the ball or, or away from the from the set piece and with ball in hand and defensively etc cetera, etc cetera. and the french at the moment they seem to be more up the guts physical i'm just going to ball carry in that and one one dimensional one out runners not exactly what i'm looking for in a dynamic modern day six nations 15. the, the- the, the props, Stephen, I mean, um, there's been, I think you're, you're picking Andrew Porter and Ty Furlong as the, the best props in the Six Nations. I think Gordon Darcy says that they're possibly some of the best in the world. Jer said on the show on Monday that, you know, it's okay that we were talking rubbish, putting Porter and Furlong into that sort of uh, category. That no. Was the best front row in the world. No. Uh, I tell, uh, so, uh, so we just, you don't get a special prize for being the best front row in the world after a couple of games. Yeah. There's no, like... There's no silver medal handed out for that. What, what, what's your idea of, of of Ireland's props in a global context? Where where do they rank? Uh, I'd argue that they're all four of them actually of the of the the, the starting and, and reserves. I would honestly argue probably second to third best behind South Africa and New Zealand. Which whichever one you want to put it at, at first, you can. I would put, I would argue the likes of the South African front row in general is the best front row in the world, and we don't know which one is which one of the two is our starting front row between the bomb squad and the the start the, the starting one because we and the other bomb squad, so yeah, exactly. Um, so we like, need to calm yeah. down. That's what you're, that's what you're saying. Calm well, the I also, down, everybody. I also, am, I, I, I am sure that we're playing Tyg Furlong in the wrong in the wrong position. He's not a prop. He's a he's a fly off. <laughs> And All he needs to do is learn is learn some some kicking from Tyke Byrne, and he will make the perfect fire for for Ireland against Italy. I think his uh, his kicking would actually be better than Tyke Byrne's uh, if we were to I don't, give him the opportunity. I don't, 
that that fifty twenty two uh, begs to differ. <laughs> well, that was a pretty sensational slash fluke uh, fluky <laughs> kick. <laughs> Swing a leg at it and see what happens. Like, oh look, that, that was just worked out. One of the best kicks that we've seen all year. Uh, okay, so um, sorry, just to remind me who your hooker was. A hooker was Jamie George, and then the backup was another Englishman. And I'll get to the, to, to Luke and Dickey in a minute. Um, George. Granted, he only played he played the most of his most of his Six Nations so far against Italy. Scored two tries and has been arguably the most consistent hooker for Eng- for England in a very long time. I don't know I don't know why Eddie Jones puts him on the bench more often than he than he starts him because I genuinely think Jamie George is is the best hooker in in England at the moment. Um, I've chosen Luke Cowan Dickey with the caveat that he has to be wearing a Scottish jersey because he definitely is not the best player for England. <laughs> Okay, uh, you picked Adam Beard. That was a bit. Um, you found that was a bit surprising to you. Yeah, I was a little bit surprised. I mean, I think we were all a little bit shocked when he was called into the the Lion squad last year. Um, I, I was a little bit amused by it as a South African, thinking that uh, this, ra- ra- this random Welshman is going to come in and uh, do anything against South Africa. And then his mall defence was absolutely amazing against the, 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 the box. And since then, he's actually grown into a much more well-rounded lock. He's got the the, the lineout skills that, um, akin to an Elwyn Jones. Obviously, he's a long way away from that from from that level. But he's you can see where where the influence has come in and how he's building onto it. And then I also think defensively as a leader, he's he's developed that, those skills to help the, the the Welsh sort of defensive system become a little bit more structured and. He's putting in those those big hits that you wouldn't expect. I do think he is suffering a little bit from the similar thing that James Ryan has been suffering from recently, and that is he's lacking a bit of physicality, and particularly with with, with his ball carries. And that's something that he needs to work on himself and, and James Ryan a little bit, because um, obviously we, we, we've discussed that at length with Ryan and in. in uh, Six Nations games against the French in um, Champions Cup games against the French opposition as well it's it's not Beard and, and Ryan both need to just bulk up a little bit more if, if, to make it a, a fully internationally but so far I think Beard has been the the standout um, lock for me is that the, at, at least from, at least from, well, from Wales is that the sound of a bird warning you that there's a baboon coming? Or like that? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that is a, that is a famous hardy dar. Uh, it's the most irritating bird on the planet. They, they usually sit outside your windows at six a.m. and do that for like twenty minutes. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, it sounds a, a little bit like the vivazelas, I've got to say. But let's let's move on to the backs because we're, we're we're we we spent too long talking about the wildlife. But it was very interesting. So look, the backs you've got Dupont at nine, Entomac at ten. I don't think anybody's going to quibble with that. Mac Hansen is 11, uh, Moifin is 12, Fiku's 13, Villiers 14, and Stuart Hogg is 15. So uh, the French backs are getting all the benefit of the French pack's power, and um, they're being shooed into your team at the moment. I wouldn't say shooed in. I think they, uh, they've, they've all earned this, but purely because they are French flair out and out, and it's spectacular to watch. Um... Of, yeah, Dupont and Intermac, you can't argue with that. Um, even even though they've only played against uh, Italy and and Ireland, I do think that Irish that Irish match uh, would has has pretty much determined the winner of the Six Nations. If Ireland won its uh, won that game, I, I think they could have won the Six Nations. As it stands now, I think France have officially won it. Um, M- uh, Morfina and and Fiku as a partnership have been arguably the the best. Um, Current centre partnership in the world. The, uh, individually, neither one of them are the best centres in the world by 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 a long shot. But together, the, w- the way they bounce off, off of each other and how Fiku in particular runs those dummy lines to open up the the field for his electric wingers out wide, they they gel so well together and they punched holes in that Irish defence. And as soon as you you got one break, that that was it. That was enough for for yeah. Dupont or. Um, pen out to to just absolutely dominate. Uh, is there was there doubt at fullback? Is Jamine a uh, consideration? Uh, Jamine was, but I think with Stuart Hogg's 
consist newfound consistency because he wasn't too consistent in November. His newfound consistency in the in the pre- past two weeks, even though it was a very lackluster performance by the Scotland against Wales, um, Hogg has been the best thing that wasn't named Hamish Watson in Scotland um, for the past two weeks, and if for nothing else, um, that's that's that sixty second minutes. What what I thought was going to be England's match winner it turned out to be Scotland's match winner when George Ford kicked a, what was going to be a 50-22. Hogg somehow managed to keep it in. And I think I, me and the rest of the, the Scottish fans, I was quote-unquote a Scottish fan in that match, um, me and the rest of the Scottish fans almost had a heart attack uh, when he he, he, did, he did that. But he, he regathered it and effectively made what would have been fantastic field position for an English line-out. Uh, into a much more difficult field position for a lineout, and subsequently the Scottish won uh, won the ball back and put it back out. So, for that moment alone, be it effectively earning the win um, against against England. Obviously, we can argue whether or not uh, Luke Cowan Dickey earned the win for the Scots or not. But uh, th- that moment in particular put him above Jaminet. Um, my second. Um, Fullback was actually Hugo Keenan, uh, purely because he's been his usual to per best, and there's not really much we can argue against yeah. uh, with with, uh, with Keenan's performance at the moment. No, for sure. Rob and Con- Rob Connie, who? <laughs> uh, SKG, thanks very much. Uh, this is the most spectacular setting we've had for an interview in a long, long time. Um, and thanks a million. No, sure. Thanks so much, guys. Enjoy the rest of the day. We'll uh, review how this team is doing. After round four, uh, you can check out otvsports.com for the full 15 and, of course, the rationale behind it and who made the bench as well.